like to introduce Aaron Johnson from CMU, and this uh, this will be a little bit longer talk than the previous. <laughs> All right, clip that in. Uh, great, so when I saw that I was in the contact planning and sensing group, I thought that was funny because uh, the talk today is really about how do I avoid having to do contact sensing or planning. Uh, and so uh, well, the sort of the high level goal for a lot of my research is that I wanna make a robot that can go anywhere in the world. Um, and so I, I try and find the roughest terrain, what's the sort of, what's the limits of the locomotive capabilities, and then think about design, think about control, think about planning and perception for, the, for these kinds of terrain. So this, I promise this is the only old video I have. Here's Rex in the Mojave Desert a few years ago, uh, actually doing surprisingly well on this uh, pretty rocky, hilly terrain. And when we got to the top of this hill, so this is the hill from before, uh, it keeps going over there. Off to the right, the rocks just got much, much bigger. And so we got here, we said, great, we made it to the top of the hill. Um, but really, the hill keeps going, and it's just that we can't think about just sort of continuing to walk in this simple way uh, to get up this hill. Uh, but instead, we'd like to start jumping from rock to rock uh, and think of a more dynamic ways to get uh, up even, even more rough terrain. So in addition to sort of the, the dynamics and the uh, the optimization that will go into the uh, jumping and leaping behaviors, we also now need to make sure that we aren't going to fall back down this hill once we make this jump. And so today's talk is really about how do we design feet for the robot that can grab onto the rock and not slip down. And for this, we look at look to biology. There are these great uh, several types of, of goats and, and similar animals. So here are mountain goats and a few other types of animals that just stand on these incredibly sheer cliffs. Uh, not just stand, but then jump, they play, they knock each other over, and somehow they don't all die instantly, the way that you'd think that, like, this guy's gotta fall down this hill, right? Um, and so we're, what we'd like to do is try and understand what are the principles behind uh, how they're able to, to actually uh, live in these environments uh, where there's very little uh, to grab onto. And so uh, looking at the, the uh, goat's foot, what we don't want to do is try and recreate it uh, exactly. So there's, there's been some prior work to try and recreate each of the bones and each of the springs. So this paper, um, I think there's eight separate springs in the, in the foot that they created here. Uh, and it does a great job of sort of matching the, the physiology, but, uh, but it's a very complicated design. Uh, and I don't think it's going to be sort of robust if you start actually smack it against a rock. Uh, as you're jumping up. So instead, we'd like to sort of pull out the, the underlying design principles and apply them in a, in a simpler way for our robot. And so today, I'll, I'll focus on sort of two main foot design principles that we're, we're looking at. Uh, and the first is looking at the sole and the shape and materials that go into it. Um, and if you look at this picture here, you can kind of get a sense that they have this sort of hard outer shell with a sort of soft pad. And in particular, the soft pad is actually a little bit concave. And that lets it sort of grab onto these different bumps. If you, if you have a, a convex uh, sole, then you're always going to be sort of tangent to what you're touching. And now you're reliant on friction. Instead, we'd like to sort of grasp onto the uh, rock and instead rely on normal force rather than tangential forces to keep us on uh, the rock. So this idea of having a hard outer shell, a soft inner, uh, to try and grab onto these, these bumps. And then the other thing that uh, we think really helps the, these animals do well on rocks is the uh, independent toes, so they're, they're two-toed animals, uh, that have very interesting stiffness and compliance properties. Uh, so the two toes can move both translationally and rotationally relative to each other, and that allows them to sort of grab onto different features without having to, uh, to sort of act, act, actively uh, adjust them to match the exact terrain. And so this leads to, this is sort of the, the two main principles we were trying to recreate with our robot hoof design. So here, uh, to, to capture the, the first one, the sort of sole material and, and shape, uh, we have 3D printed, this is a resin 3D printer, uh, although this ultimately could be something like aluminum or something that would last a little longer. Uh, 
uh, the hard outer shell, and then cast in plastics, this is, or rubbers rather, this is a urethane rubber. Um, in particular, we selected this rubber, it has actually a, a stiffening spring property, meaning that it's soft at the beginning and gets stiffer as we go along, and that'll let it, allow it to conform to the terrain uh, in a really nice way. So we cast the, the rubber into the hard uh, outer sole, and then for the, uh, for the compliance of the individual toes, rather than having, uh, as the other foot had, eight separate little springs with separate degrees of freedom, we'd like to try and uh, design a, a monolithic compliant element that we can then tune the individual stiffness properties as well as the coupling between them. Uh, and so for that, we've been using uh, sort of bent spring steel where we can sort of change the geometry of these different segments. It's still one piece of metal, uh, and, but we can get different stiffness properties and different coupling between these uh, compliant directions. And so that's the sort of the idea that led to, to the current uh, foot design, which I'll have uh, in my bag all week if you'd like to come squish the rubber or, or see the, the sole. Um, and so what we've done so far is uh, the, the Rocky Mountain test, where we have these four beautiful pieces of Rocky Mountain uh, in the lab that we're testing, uh, testing the foot at sort of different uh, angles and different uh, configurations. So I'll show you some of these tests here. Uh, we have some uh, quantitative experiments. They're not, uh, where those are still ongoing, so I don't have any numbers to show you. But uh, qualitatively, the, the design seems to be doing a good job of conforming to the terrain without having to do very careful uh, foot placement. And so there in particular, on this one, you can see how the two toes really let you uh, grab onto to very rough uh, rocks. So um, again, I'll have these. I've got several different rubbers if you want to squish them. Uh, I also want to then advertise uh, the other talks from my lab that uh, will be coming up. So in a moment here, there'll be a video from Amir Patel from uh, South Africa. He's showing some, uh, some things that I think fit in this section maybe a little better about wheels versus ankles and losing optimization to try and answer these kind of uh, fundamental morphology questions. Uh, and then later, Joe is going to be sh presenting his work on uh, optimizing tail behavior. How do you use your tail in concert with your legs in order to uh, run more efficiently uh, and ultimately uh, recover more robust behavior on rough terrain? Uh, and then finally, uh, Nikolai is an undergrad in my lab, uh, is going to uh, show a video about a cheap $200 version of Rex uh, that's all off the shelf parts and 3D printed. Uh, if you'd like to have your very own Rex for, for outreach or, uh, or playing around in your lab. Uh, all of their posters are right at the top of the stairs when you're out there on the second floor landing. There's a lovely seating area in front of those posters if you want to go hang out by them. Um, and then I'll end with, here's a bunch of other stuff that we do in my lab uh, as well that uh, we're not going to talk about today. Um, but if you're interested in, say, fuzzy tails, I also have uh, some fur samples if you'd like to play with those as well. Thank you. very much and thanks for bringing uh, visual and tactile aids and thanks as well to Ali previously I wanted to thank for that as well because that's very exciting we actually have a boatload of time for questions so start us off Amos. <laughs> whichever one um, how confident are you that that a hoof would be maybe the best choice to climb a rocky environment opposed to like a hand or, or even like a, a camel's foot which is a lot more conformal and, and, I, and I think related to this too do you think goats were like macro evolution evolved to be in mountains, or maybe they were just dumped there at some point and had some micro evolution adaptations. So this is like a local optimal because because they're stuck there. Yeah, I mean I don't know the, the sort of evolutionary history there. Um, I think the I think the I, the approach that we take is to to try and uh, understand this with the design principles. And so it's not that we're trying to just recreate the goat hoof, um, but we actually uh, uh, something like we've listed like ten individual parts of that design that we think might contribute to uh, a more successful locomotion on, on that kind of terrain. And then we're trying to test them sort of individually and in concert uh, to try and understand which of these are historical anomalies or because they have to be made out of you know, living material, uh, and which of these are sort of actually because they contribute to the, uh, to the locomotion on, on, the, on the rocky terrain. It could be that a lot of these things are because they also need to work on 
uh, on land or that they all need to dig to get their food or something. You know, there's lots of other reasons that they could have any of these individual features. It's an interesting question. If we have a real life biologist in the audience with some background in uh, evolution, it would be interesting to hear you chime in. In the meantime, Andy. <laughs> Uh, you know, like tires use rubber and they have a coefficient of friction of about one. Yeah. And so you, uh, if you take your material, it's got a coefficient of friction of one or less, presumably. So on flat ground, you're no better than a chunk of rubber. On rough rocks, what is the effective coefficient of friction you get from your hoof? What, sl what angle, so, what so angle yeah. can you put a force? The, the answer your... is, I, I don't believe in, fr I mean, friction is just horrible. I mean, it's, it's just really unreliable. And even if you have something like a no, but you have one. You are I understand trying. that by by switching to I use this term macro friction. Maybe someone can tell me if this is a real word or not. Um, but what I want is the normal force, right? And and that is going to be as up to material fail, failure of the the hoof or the rock, right? I want to cup the rock and push normally rather than tangentially. So it, in some ways it, it doesn't quite make sense to think about it as a coefficient of friction. You take it's a not, well, it shouldn't be core, it shouldn't be proportional to the normal force. I'm sure it is. If you take a typical rough surface, your hoof has some uh, behavior, t typical shear force it can handle for given rough for given. Yeah, but I don't think that, that, that I don't think that that's a sort of as uh, it doesn't tra it doesn't extrapolate in the same way uh, to other materials and other or to other situations, in the same way that a, a coefficient of friction. But you have, if I give you a rock with some slope. There's yeah. some biggest slope you don't slide down. Um, if I have that exact rock and I'm putting my foot on the exact same spot. Yeah, so for some sure. typical rough rock, yeah. what slope do you not slide down with your hoof? Uh, there's not, I, I don't think that there is like a, a particular limit on that. Maybe, maybe a related question I had is uh, if you just put a big lump of that same rubber at the end, do you have a sense of how it might compare on your substrates? Oh, that, that we... Yeah, so it should be much better than that because the, the rubber, it's, uh, again, it's up to coefficient of friction of let's say one because that's convenient. Um, and so we, you know, we can get much higher, much more than, you know, we can get, in terms of a slope, coefficient of friction of one gives you, what, 45 degrees or something. And so this, with the, the idea with the macro friction is that you're actually grabbing onto little bumps in a normal force. And so it can be up to 90. It can be beyond 90 is depending on how bumpy it is, right? Uh, I see Chris back there. So, when I was taught how to modify, it was all about insertion, inserting my somewhat large fingers into tiny little cracks. And it seems to me that, you know, if you were God, you want to design a super goat, you know, the, 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 it would have little tiny amoeba-like things that sort of go into cracks and then turn into, uh, you know, very rigid things. Or it could be you should have jamming hooves that match yeah. the shape of the rock and then solidify. Yeah, we've talked about, I mean, the, the, the jamming manipulator style, uh, my impression is that those don't, they, they have sort of uh, longevity and, and repeatability issues where the, the little grains of, uh, whatever wear down. Um, what what I haven't shown here is is any of the endurance tests. So this also, you know, you, it has to not just work once, but it has to work thousands of times in a row. Otherwise, you're going to be swapping out your feet every few minutes. Um, I think I think it's sort of another approach that gets to what you're saying is the microspine approach. So Aaron Parnes has these little tiny, and I think that gets closer to if you want to just sort of reach in and grab a little tiny bump. You have a lot of these in the sort of rise or, uh, or spiny bot uh, style. Would you, would you agree that the micro spine is, is, what you're, is the limit of, uh, of what you're suggesting there? I'm really excited about ice nine. Yeah, so adhesive, adhesive is great because you can get, uh, you know, you can stick to any slope, right? It doesn't have to be. Uh, so yeah, so non-adhesive uh, climbing, I guess I'll say. Uh, yeah. We've had uh, Hansel waiting very patiently to ask a question. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you have a worst case scenario for your hoof design? For Sorry, worst example, case for what? Worst case scenario for your hoof. Maybe mm. there is just life-sized luck that will make your hoof fail or something uh, like that? Yeah. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to grab onto little bumps. And so I think the worst case would be 
uh, a concave thing that, where we can't actually grab onto anything, where we're sort of boxed out of it. Where perhaps uh, a convex ball of rubber may do better. Yeah, if you're going into a concave smooth hole, yeah. Cool. Uh, I would say, I would guess that would be our worst case. The other thing is that we're trying to sort of jump and, and bound and very, very dynamic here. If you watched the, the Mountain Goat video earlier, they're actually sliding, they're falling off all the time. Um, and so you, I don't think you can be afraid of falling if you're going to get into this game. So, so you have to sort of try and get your, your best possible step, but then a lot of the tail work that we're doing is to give you something that you can, some actuator you can apply. If, you're, if your foot slips, all right, now you can't apply a force with that. Uh, the tail is one option for sort of still being able to apply some control authority uh, if you're in this, if, if, you, if you find like the worst possible uh, foothold spot. I'm going to go ahead and call on uh, Noah as our poor man's approximation to a biologist. <laughs> Great. So, um, uh, so it's, you actually mentioned spinal but I was going to ask that, but actually sort of there's this sort of scale between how do you sort of modulate the stiffness of the individual element and then sort of how many of those do you articulate and if you've sort of thought about depending on the terrain, the mass of the robot and so on, is there kind of a set of design principles you might be able to extract about sort of how to do that bifurcation? Yeah, wait, like when should you switch to, to micro spines? Yeah, and sort of, is that a sort of a continuous, do you have several smaller, individually articulated, stiffer things, or? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think for any of these, you have to, you have to have a notion of, of uh, complexity, you know, design complexity, and, uh, and so I'm trying to go for, for simple designs, so this monolithic uh, compliant element, you know, solid cast rubber as opposed to a lot of little moving parts, that'll break, that'll get sand in them. Uh, I think that the micro spines work really well if you're moving slowly and if you really don't want to fall. And that sort of gives you the highest chance of catching uh, a little asperity. I think the numbers on Rise, Rise had I think, I'm gonna say 30 micro spines, but it only needed four of them to catch on to hold the weight of the robot. Um, and so that's like a pretty good ratio uh, for, for sort of guaranteeing safety. Uh, in, the, in the kind of dynamic regime of hopping from rock to rock, I think it's much harder to try and engage those little micro spines, and I think they're just going to get destroyed, uh, honestly. You know, I, I need something that I can smack against the, the table and be totally uh, okay with that. All right, I've now taken us way over time, so let's thank Aaron again.